and there was silence for half an hour. <laughs> uh, a little revolution, revelation humor for the initiated. Um, <laughs> all right. Brian has put together the uh, syllabus or the, the schedule for us. Uh, it's up here. I think rather than taking time right now to just hand, hand those, well, we can do that. We can take time. You'll just uh, pass some out, though, pass some down. Yeah. 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 How's everybody doing tonight? Good, good. Well, uh, as you'll see on the schedule, Brian uh, has, has put together four or five, about five, uh, inter six introductory lessons before we dive directly into the text of Revelation itself, which we'll hit at basically the rate of one chapter per class. And um, um, what we're trying to do in part in some of these introductory <coughs> things is just lay some groundwork, uh, build some vocabulary, uh, both in, in literal words as well as in symbols and ideas that uh, will be useful to us as we get into the text and try to interpret the uh, message of Revelation uh, when we get there. So hopefully uh, you'll benefit from this, even if you don't absorb it all or it doesn't all make sense at the, at the time. Uh, there will probably be some things that you'll pick up that as we get into the uh, study proper will help uh, give it uh, clarity. So tonight the, spe spe uh, the specific uh, focus is on Old Testament background uh, to the book of Revelation. And um, I'll really be honest with you, I don't know when I've had a harder time trying to uh, <coughs> A class together than this and and the reason is not because of a scarcity of material you know like trying to figure out well where in the Old Testament is there something referred to in the book of Revelation but rather the problem is the opposite and it's like everything in the book of Revelation has an Old Testament reference in fact it is without even uh, anything coming close the most uh, um, hyperlinked book of the Bible. It's, it's, it's got more allusions and references to uh, other biblical events and Old Testament uh, uh, scripture than any other uh, book in the New Testament or really uh, uh, any book of the Bible at all. In fact, uh, there are 404 verses in Revelation and uh, scholars have said that uh, there are over 350 Old Testament uh, allusions or ref, uh, references in those 404 verses. So basically, in other words, everything John has to say has some tie-in or some reference to an Old Testament story, symbol, event, person, uh, things like that. But what's really challenging about it is it doesn't approach it the way that most New Testament books approach their use of the Old Testament. For instance, uh, just taking an example in Acts, um, uh, Luke quoting Peter's Sermon on the Day of Pentecost, where he's trying to explain the apostles all speaking in tongues on that day, and they are being accused of being drunk. And uh, Peter says, it's, it, these are men are not drunk, as you suppose, but what? This is, yeah, yeah. Some of y'all are doing good, but others you're really going to struggle because you, you don't even know Joel. Uh, <laughs> Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes the prophet Joel who spoke about God pouring out his spirit on all flesh uh, in, in the latter days. So uh, there you have, uh, a New Testament speaker and writer citing, maybe not book, chapter, and verse, but a specific reference in the Old Testament and, and saying, this is what I'm doing here. Or even the Hebrew writer will sometimes be a little more vague and he'll say something like, um, uh, as it says somewhere, I think is one of the ways the Hebrew writer puts it. But even if he doesn't give the specific reference, he's at least cluing you in as a reader that he's citing some Old Testament passage. John never does that in the book of Revelation. There's not a single place where he says, 
in the prophet Ezekiel or Daniel or as it says in the law or any place like that. He, he never cites his sources. He never gives away to the reader where he's drawing his material from. He just sort of assumes that you are going to get it, which is a problem for us because even though um, many of us who've, who've grown up in church and been going to Bible classes all our lives, been Bible readers, who know the Bible pretty well, we, we tend to know the Old Testament stories and characters uh, and specific laws maybe uh, pretty well. But when it comes to some of the prophetic language and some of the symbols that are contained in the Old Testament, that's kind of our weak spot. And the bad news is that's where John goes to the most. So uh, that's why it's, I think, one reason why it's a very challenging uh, book to us. But uh, Revelation uses imagery and symbols and numbers um, from books like uh, Exodus, primarily the second half of Exodus, not the narrative part so much about the story of Israel's deliverance from Egypt, but the construction of the tabernacle uh, and the very detailed things that are uh, involved there. The book of Leviticus, everyone's favorite. Um, Isaiah the prophet, Ezekiel the prophet, Daniel the prophet, and again, not the first half of Daniel that, that most of us really love those stories, but the latter part of Daniel where it gets really crazy. Uh, those are the places primarily where John draws uh, his Old Testament uh, references from. So, as I said, my struggle in preparing the class was to try to just narrow it down and decide what Old Testament stuff I was going to try to show the connections that, that John is making in the, in the Revelation uh, 2. So uh, I'm sure I left out some of your favorites and maybe some of mine, but I think we'll benefit from what we see. Before we uh, uh, dive in, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for uh, your love, for your continued presence with us and among us, your protection over us. And Father, we are thankful right now for the word that you've given us and the revelation of your son Jesus that was given to John and that he has written down for our benefit. I pray that as we study tonight and throughout the course of this trimester, that we'll grow in our understanding of who you are and what you have done and what you are doing and what you will do, that we might take comfort and strength and encouragement from seeing things not just on the surface of how they appear to us from our earthbound point of view, but that ultimately we might, like John, come to see things uh, not just in heaven, but from heaven's perspective, and thereby be strengthened in our wisdom, in our understanding, in our patience and perseverance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, Old Testament background. Well, um, when you think about the, Revel the book of Revelation and you think of an Old Testament image or story or event that, that you can immediately think, oh yeah, I see that. I see how that Old Testament thing is showing up and being used by John here in the New Testament. What's the something that comes to your mind? The plagues on Egypt. The, the plagues on Egypt, yeah. The, these, these, these uh, you know, we have the... the the seven seals, we have the seven trumpets, we have the seven bowls of, of wrath, all of these things, a uh, series of, of seven things that, uh, that, that come out. And, and so many of these things remind us of the plagues that uh, were brought on uh, Egypt. So that's, that's a, a really good one. Unfortunately, it's not one of the ones that I, I decided to, <laughs> to bring in. Not, uh, what else? The woman and the serpent. Yeah, the woman, uh, yeah, yeah, chapter 12, uh, sort of a central place and sort of a transitional chapter, it seems to me like in the book where you have this image of this, this pregnant woman. She's giving birth to a, to a child. She has, uh, uh, her face is shining like the sun. She's standing on the moon. She's got a crown of stars on her head. And uh, there is a fiery red dragon that's there ready to, to devour her child when it's born. Yeah, that, that, one's, that one's really, really crazy. But what does that sort of remind you of, this, this woman and her seed uh, that's about to be born into this world and a serpent? Yeah, yeah, 
the Genesis 3.15 connection of uh, the, the, the promise that there would be enmity between her seed and the seed of the servant. Anything else? Babylon. Babylon, yeah. Babylon, going back, so it's prototype in the Tower of Babel and then certainly coming back again in the Babylonian Empire and uh, the contrast, the Old Testament bold contrast between Jerusalem, the city of God, and Babylon, the, you know, the wicked, uh, horrible city. And these two in conflict with one another, and that clearly is a, is a major theme in the book of Revelation. I think with a really ironic twist, as Brian already pointed out from last week, in that Jerusalem becomes Babylon, uh, like horror of horrors uh, to, to the Jews. But I, I think that's uh, one of the things John is going to reveal to us. Uh, all right, well, uh, enough of what y'all think. I thought that somebody <laughs> would say, yeah, well, it's the Garden of Eden, because we, 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 we love the way the book of Revelation ends, right? It's such a, a beautiful picture, not only of the New Jerusalem coming down and the description of the beautiful city there, but the city is sort of resting on or is a development of what? Garden of Eden. I knew you'd get there. Uh, so he says in chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Right? The river of the water of life. Brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. That may throw us because we're, we're familiar in Genesis 2 with the rivers, the, the water that rises up in the garden and splits into four rivers that go in the, toward the four corners, the four directions, the four major points of, of the compass, north, south, east, and west. The river flows out of Eden. We maybe would see that here, but uh, maybe we don't remember the throne of God being there. But then again, what happens in Eden between God and people? Adam and Eve. Sin. Yeah, they, they're, they're together, aren't they? So it's like God is not only Adam and Eve there in the garden, but they walk with God in the cool of the day, or he, he visits them. So there's something about the, the presence of God. It doesn't say throne specifically, but I think we'll see later tonight that that's implied. And he says uh, that this river runs through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. Now that definitely grabs our attention, right? Going back to Genesis 2. Tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything <coughs> cursed, or some translations put it, no longer will there be any curse. Where do we read about first thing? Time we read about a curse. Yeah, Genesis 3. After the sin, then comes the curse. Curse of sin. But here we see the curse is removed and the servants will worship him. They will see his face. So again, like Adam and Eve with God in the garden. And his name will be on their, their foreheads. Um, and night will be no more. They will need no light of the lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Now, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so we, we see this uh, uh, beautiful garden imagery here at the book at the end of the book and it and it does clearly echo Genesis chapter 2 doesn't it so this is definitely one of the places where John's drawing uh, important information and imagery from uh, where we're told in Genesis 2 that the Lord God planted this garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is planted in the site pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. And then we'll go into the details, but it tells how all these uh, rivers flowed off. Again, the idea is to the four corners of the earth, and the places that they went, there were resources there, and the idea probably is that people could go out and mine these resources and bring the gold and the bedelium and all these other beautiful gemstones and things like that and bring them back into the garden and build up the temple and throne of, of God there. That's what a lot of people uh, think is implied there. They, um, keep on skipping. Uh, and 
at the, after he's described these four rivers, it says the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Um, a lot of people think that work is something that's a consequence of the fall, but this tells us that work was prior to the fall. Work is part of the good of God's creation, not part of the bad. Now, there are aspects of it now that carry the curse, but work in and of itself is a good thing. Remember, God worked six days, and uh, we, as his image bearers, do so as well. But he not only put man there to work the garden, you know, cultivate it, uh, but he also put him there to keep it, right? He's there to um, uh, defend it, protect it, um, which would imply that there might be reason to do so. That there could be something that would spoil this good creation if not <clears throat> defended against. And uh, that's really the significance of the word, to, to keep it. Um, there's other places where the same Hebrew word is used to describe priests at the tabernacle and temple who we all often think of only as working by offering up sacrifices, but they are also there to post, uh, as, to function as guards and to defend this holy sanctuary from transgressors who were not authorized to enter in. Now, what, what's interesting here is uh, how does man lose his garden home uh, there with the, uh, dwelling with God and having access to the tree of life and the waters that, that uh, flow from it and all the, the beauty and abundance that's associated with it and bring this curse upon himself. How does he do that? They listen to Satan. Yeah, by listening to the serpent, right? Who again, as has already pointed out, shows up in the book of Revelation still as... Uh, our old and ancient enemy, still up to no good, uh, and still working through agents, um, beasts um, um, that rise up out of the sea that he's giving power to, uh, even the great harlot, Babylon is animated by the ultimately the power of this dragon, this serpent uh, of, of old. So. Um, we know that that's how, uh, by, by giving in, being seduced by, and giving in to the lie of Satan, uh, he was driven from the guard. So there's actually two consequences um, of this that are, are, I want to look at. The first, as was mentioned earlier, this enmity that he said would be between the woman and her offspring uh, and the serpent's offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So throughout Scripture we see enmity between the seed of the offspring of, of Satan and the offspring of the woman. So sort of this uh, battle between the godly and the ungodly that have at their source uh, Satan and God, right? So whoever one is dominant in a person's life or a family's life or a culture's life is at odds with and enmity with uh, the other. And then the other thing is that he drove out the man as a consequence of the sin. And at the east end of the garden, he, that's God, placed the cherubim and flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Um, so these cherubim appear now to, I believe, take the place of, in part, uh, Adam and Eve and humanity, whose job it was to remember to keep the garden. They didn't keep it. They didn't defend it from the evil intruder. And so they, having now become evil themselves, are driven from God's presence and from this beautiful garden. And in their place are cherubim who now are to defend the holy space and prevent humans from coming back and gaining access to the tree of life inappropriately. All right, now I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit and, and say that these cherubim appear in the book of Revelation, though not by name specifically. In chapter four, we are introduced to four living creatures. 
And we know that they're cherubim because <coughs> their description is basically identical to that of the four living creatures that Ezekiel describes and who he clearly identifies as cherubim, who bear the uh, ark of, of God, the throne of God, on their shoulders. So these, these guardians of God's throne uh, and defenders of God's garden, his holy space, uh, who have taken the role of humanity to, to do this uh, also show up in the book of, of Revelation. So we're going to see this garden restored at the end of the book. Um, we're going to see the cherubim show up. We're going to see the river uh, that flows out that brings life and healing to the world. Uh, at the end of the book, we're going to see... Um, uh, a number of these elements that are contained in, in Genesis 1 through 3 being uh, returned to as, as things that John wants us to, to see. Now, this reference to the cherubim at the end of, of that section brings us to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is one of John's major um, Old Testament uh, images that he draws uh, from for the book of Revelation. That's the temple, the tabernacle that becomes then uh, in the temple under David and then Solomon in the monarchy, kingdom period. So um, the tabernacle was a placeholder between Eden that was lost and Eden that we see restored here in Revelation. So Eden, this, this dwelling place of God and man, this place of, of beauty, um, and this place of God's presence with his people, uh, there's a, 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 a substitute, a placeholder that serves for a period of time as sort of a nexus between heaven and earth, the place where God dwells with people, and that becomes the, that, that's what the temple or the tabernacle is. So it fills that purpose for uh, a set period of time. In Exodus, the 24th chapter, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai where he has shown to him the pattern for the tabernacle that he's going to construct. Um, and in some ways, you can look at that story in the description of Mount Sinai and you can almost see that Mount Sinai like is the pattern uh, that is shown to Moses with all of the Things God meeting with him at the top of the Moses uh, at the top of Mount Sinai would be like the most holy place. There's a like a sapphire pavement partway up the mountain that divides that whole the most holy place off from the holy space where Nadab, Abihu, and the other leaders of Israel ate and drank in God's presence. Um, and then the boundary marker at the base of Mount Sinai where all the people could draw near but could not transgress on pains of death. And that becomes, this uh, temple becomes, the tabernacle and the temple becomes sort of the uh, model of Mount Sinai, the pattern of, of, of heaven coming down to earth that is revealed to Moses. Now, what, what I find really interesting is that when he begins to give descriptions of the tabernacle, uh, not descriptions, but instructions for its, for its construction and the articles of furniture that are to go in it, uh, the most important part was the most holy place with the centerpiece of the most holy place being the Ark of the Covenant, right? With the mercy seat uh, over it. And what was the last thing we saw about Eden and man being driven out of it? The cherubim, right? That were, were there. Well, guess where they pop up again? Here with the tabernacle and the Ark and the Holy of Holies. He describes the construction of the ark this way uh, and the mercy seat that goes over it. That's the part in Raiders of the Lost Ark when they lifted it up. Everybody's <laughs> faces got melted off. He says, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work you shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. So you've got these two Cherubim showing up again. Last time we saw them was Genesis 3. Now here they are as guardians 
of God's throne, of his holy presence, to keep unlawful intruders out. Uh, there, they, there they are um, being fashioned uh, in the tabernacle. Uh, make one cherubim on one end, the other on the other. Um, they'll spread their wings, shadowing over the mercy seat, facing one another. Um, put the mercy seat on top of the ark, in it you'll place the testimony that I'll give you, and there I will meet with you. So this is God's throne where people are going to be able to approach him. Now, they're not actually going to be able to just come right in there. Only the high priest once a year is going to be able to actually gain access there. But this is going to be the, the symbolic presence of God among his people is at, uh, at the uh, mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant where the cherubim are in the Holy of Holies at the temple. And um, uh, there God will communicate his commandments uh, to the people. Um, now he also mentions in chapter, the next chapter, chapter 26, 31, you should make a veil. This is what separates the Holy of Holies from the holy place in the tabernacle or temple. And you'll make a veil that separates the two and make it of blue and purple and scarlet and arms <coughs> and fine twine linen and it shall be made with what? Cherubim skillfully worked into it. So these are still, again, the idea of they are the guardians of God's throne. Um, he's described in many places in the Old Testament as being enthroned above the cherubim. Psalm 99.1, Isaiah 37.16 uh, are just two to give you reference to. Uh, I hope this isn't too, too tedious for you to, to follow. Um, as I said, th this is all coming from places that we're not often as familiar with. But in Ezekiel, e Ezekiel's prophecy is ex probably the most important Old Testament book to familiarize yourself with for a helpful base, basis for, for interpreting Revelation. The, the two of them almost map on top of one another in a remarkable way. But in Ezekiel chapter 10... As Ezekiel has a vision of God's uh, throne in heaven, he's not actually seeing into the, the temple in Jerusalem. He's, he's more seeing into what it represents, God's, God's dwelling place in heaven. And as he, as he looks into it, he sees four cherubim who are there bearing God's throne and the guardians of God's throne. Then... In Revelation 4, as I mentioned earlier, while cherubim isn't used, as John begins to give his revelation uh, of, of things properly, and he sees the throne of God in heaven, he has these four living creatures that are exactly what Ezekiel had described uh, centuries before in his vision of creatures that were described, that, were, that are identified as cherubim. So we still see these, these guardians of God's throne. So John is seeing into the throne room of God, into the true holy of holies, is, is what he's peering into when he is in the spirit, to use John's language, and door is, a door is open into heaven, and he's beholding the four living creatures bearing the throne of God, <clears throat> guardians of his throne and holy space. So that's what this imagery is being taken from. Now again, the connection with Ezekiel is important, I can't stress enough uh, its importance in interpreting Revelation. Uh, in fact, the Bible Project's video on Revelation is, is okay. It's not their best, I don't think. It's, it's, it's okay. Um, but their, uh, their work on the book of Ezekiel is outstanding. In, in fact, I would say don't waste your time with their video on Revelation, but the two videos they have on Ezekiel would give you a really good thumbnail sketch of how Ezekiel what Ezekiel's vision is about and a good way to help you be up to speed as we get into the book of Revelation. Um, now, here's where it gets interesting. Both Ezekiel and John are prophets living in exile and they are predicting the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the destruction of the temple and its true replacement. 
So that's what, in a large part, both of these books are about. Now, in chapters 8 through 11 of Ezekiel, he sees the temple in Jerusalem. Now, let me give you a little bit more background. Ezekiel has, uh, this is, this is uh, when Nebuchadnezzar has begun to make his move against Jerusalem, and he's taking captives out of Jerusalem and bringing them to Babylon. Ezekiel was among the very first captives to be taken. And on his 30th birthday of all times, he who, uh, Ezekiel, who was, was in a priestly family, <laughs> finds himself sitting beside an irrigation ditch in the desert of, of, of um, you know, Babylon. And uh, that's, that's a terrible way to spend your 30th birthday, especially if you're a, a priestly lineage, because what happens to priests on their 30th birthdays? They begin serving as, as priests, right? That's my remembrance of it. And instead of being able to go and serve at the temple in Jerusalem, he's stuck in Babylon, but he has a vision. He gets to go anyway. And God gives him a vision of the temple in Jerusalem. And what he sees there in chapters 8 through 11 is that beautiful, holy temple of God in Jerusalem with the priests worshiping idols, both around and within the temple. Uh, which is a good explanation for why they're all in the trouble that they're in. The next thing he sees in his vision is God's spirit that promised to dwell in the temple and above these cherubim being lifted up out of the temple in Jerusalem and coming, guess where? Yeah, to, to Babylon, okay? So he's leaving Jerusalem and he's coming to dwell with the exiles in Babylon. And uh, he's being carried on a chariot of sorts, a throne. His throne's being carried by, by guess what? Cherubim, four living creatures, and they're carrying uh, God, uh, and, and he's leaving the temple because of its corruption, and he's saying goodbye to that, and he's coming to, to dwell with his exiled people. Now, uh, John is, is largely seeing the same thing. What his claim is, I believe, in, in part in the book, is that God's presence is no longer to be identified with the temple in Jerusalem that had been rebuilt in, uh, um, you know, in what we call Herod's temple, really like the third temple. But he's saying God's presence doesn't really dwell there. Where, where is God's presence? With his people. Yeah, with his people, who John would identify as the church. Right? The, that would now be the people, and, and these people are kind of in exile. They're kind of stuck out there. They're no longer really uh, able to identify with Judaism anymore. It looks like, you know, they don't have a temple. They don't have a priesthood. They don't have sacrifices to offer. But God's going to show John in his affliction away from, from home uh, a vision of how things really are. And that is that they do have a priest and king. And it's the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, who has made John and his followers priests and kings. And even though they may not feel like it, it may not look like it from an earthly perspective, this is the reality as God sees it. And John is given great strength and comfort from being able to, to see it this way. And not only that, but God is promising that he's going to deal with the now corrupt uh, temple and priests, uh, that he's going to bring judgment on them. And uh, the book is going to give us details about that judgment. So his presence removed from the, back to Ezekiel 8, what Ezekiel sees, God's presence leaving the temple in Jerusalem and coming to live with his exiles, uh, his presence removed from the Jerusalem temple meant that his judgment was coming to the Jerusalem temple. Then in chapter 33 of Ezekiel, 
we see that in fact Jerusalem falls just as the um, revelation that he received predicted and the temple is destroyed. But then later in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, he's given another vision of the temple, but this is what uh, people call the ideal temple. It's not like a literal temple that could be constructed out of physical materials, but it's the ideal temple of God's <laughs> dwelling place with, with, with man. And what's really interesting as you get to the, toward the end of his description of this ideal temple that God says is going to come and replace the one that was destroyed then by Nebuchadnezzar, is he says uh, this. This is how Ezekiel is describing what, what God's showing him about the true ideal temple that's, that's going to come. He says, he brought me back to the door of the temple uh, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Okay. So what's, what's the image? Water is flowing out of where? Out of the temple. And how deep is the water, Mama? <laughs> it's ankle deep, okay? Well... I don't know exactly what this means. He measured a, another thousand. Maybe it means he's turning to the four corners or something like that. I don't, I don't know. I don't remember the details of this. But he measures again. And this time, a little bit later, it's needy. And then he goes another thousand, whatever. Again, that means. And now it's what? It's wasted. It's, it's, it's getting deeper. Water's rising. And this water's coming out of the temple. And he measured it uh, once more. And it was so deep that he could not pass. Uh, the water had risen. You could, you, it was deep enough to swim, but you, it was so deep and so moving so uh, with such force you could not pass through it. And then as he looked at where this water was going, as it flowed out of the temple, this ideal temple that God's saying he's going to, to build, that on the banks of both sides of this mighty river that's flowing out of it, what, is, what does he see? Trees that are for food. And then he says, and their leaves will not wither. Now, where have we read that tonight? Revelation 22, right? So what Ezekiel is seeing that God's going to ultimately do is build a temple, a place for him to dwell among his people. And from beneath the threshold of that temple is going to flow out healing waters into the world and it's going to populate trees that will be uh, bear fruit that will not uh, um, wither and leaves and, and fruit that will not wither um, because this water that flows to them is coming from the sanctuary and their leaves will be for healing. Again, all of that's what we saw in, in Revelation 22. So again, I, I would encourage you if you want to try to look to Old Testament sources that, that John is clearly drawing from and you think about the temple and the tabernacle and the ark and the cherubim and all of the things that are associated with that, Ezekiel is your guy. Now one more that uh, we need to look at is something that is up toward the front of the book of Revelation and that's his depiction of the Son of Man. Now in Revelation chapter 1, I don't have this on the screen, but John um, describes um, verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice like a, a, voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches of, of Asia. Um, and then, verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and as I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, again, temple imagery, and in the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest, his hair was like uh, white, and his eyes aflame, his feet like burnished bronze, and this, this glorious description of one like the Son of Man. And clearly, uh, as he comes to chapter Five. He doesn't use the phrase son of man, but it's obviously the same person that he has in view 
And that person was identified in chapter 1 as Jesus Christ, the glorified, risen, and ascended Christ. And that same person then is in the maiden drama uh, that unfolds beginning in chapter 5, um, where, where he sees um, what he calls the, the root of David. Um, let's just look at, at, at that, Revelation 5, beginning in verse 1. Then I saw the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, that's, that's God, the Father, uh, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty, mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. One of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, there's our cherubim, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So where is this son of man figure standing? Yeah. At the throne of God. He's entered, as it were, back into uh, this holy space, this Edenic space. He's standing in the holy of holies before the throne of God where the cherubim uh, have let him uh, enter in. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne which uh, basically uh, means that the Son of Man enters the throne and becomes the executor of God's plan to rule through the Messiah and the Messiah's people. Now, the question is, where, where uh, well, let me say it uh, this way again to try to make some of this uh, as relevant as I, I can, thinking of first century Christians who had seen Jesus of Nazareth and uh, maybe had known him or had heard of him through the testimony of the uh, disciples and apostles and had known him to be crucified um, and, and, and killed and maybe they had heard, no doubt if they were Christians, they had heard of uh, his resurrection and the claim of the apostles to have seen him ascended into to heaven, uh, you know, but, but like, where is he now? What is he doing? And uh, what about us? And so this kind of vision of seeing Jesus from the other side, okay, from heaven's point of view, changes everything, right? He's no longer the, uh, just, just the crucified victim, the lamb slain, but he's also the what? God. Yeah, he's, he's the, the lion, right, who's ruling and who is in control and who is glorified. Um, and they needed to see that in order to have the patience and endurance to get through the fiery trial that they were already undergoing and, and was about to get even, even worse. Now, back to the point of tonight's study is, is uh, you know, where does... John get this from? Well, I want to be careful and not say, well, he's just lifting from the Old Testament. I think John's seeing this, but he's seeing the same thing that Old Testament prophets had also seen. So in Daniel uh, chapter 7, Daniel was also one of the exiles in Babylon taken from Jerusalem. In some 450 years B.C., um, he has a vision in which he sees four beasts rising up out of the sea. And that's kind of going to be something, again, we're going to see in Revelation, these beasts emerging up out of the, the sea. And we're told that these beasts represent four empires. And specifically, we know that the first empire was the Babylonian Empire, and then came the Persian Empire that threw them over, and then came um, the... the um, the Greek, uh, the Greek Empire with uh, Alexander the, the Great coming, coming and uh, bringing uh, that rule into uh, uh, throughout the, that part of the world. And then finally, the, the Roman Empire was the fourth beast. And in the days of this, this fourth beast, 
Daniel says that he saw uh, the Ancient of Days seated on his throne. But then he sees something uh, really fascinating in chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. He says, I saw in these night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So just like in Revelation 5, you have Jesus coming before the throne of God to receive the scroll out of his hand, Daniel, 500 years earlier, had seen the same thing prophesied. He said, in the days of the Roman Empire, one like the Son of Man would come and approach the Ancient of Days, and to him would be given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve. And his dominion is everlasting, it will not pass away, his kingdom shall not be destroyed. So this is that, though John doesn't use that language. He doesn't say, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Daniel. He says, I'm seeing now the fulfillment of what Daniel, five centuries earlier, predicted would happen. And Jesus is that son of man who has come to the ancient of days and received the kingdom. And, uh, well, we'll just have to, to end there. But you can see that, that Dan, uh, John is, is, is clearly drawing from or seeing the same things from the same perspective as these many Old Testament prophets. All right. Hopefully that's helpful. I think those will be pieces we can